The Innovators Network. Welcome to the Killer Innovation Show, the longest continuously produced podcast in history. Each week, Phil McKinney brings you the insights and strategies to amplify your creativity and innovation skills. Here's your host, Phil McKinney. Welcome to this week's Innovation Show. This week, we are going to be talking with a tool vendor. Now, during COVID, we all scrambled to find new tools that will allow us to support and create uh, innovations and ideas and continue the work we do, even though all of us were forced to work from home. One of the tool vendors that got a lot of traction early on in COVID was Mural. Now, at that time, Mural was focused as a digital whiteboard option. I've talked about them here on the show before. Today, we have Jim Callback. Jim is the chief evangelist at Mural. He's been there eight or nine years, talking through both what Mural's experience as a digital whiteboard into Mural's transformation to being much broader as a collaboration tool, uh, visual methods, um, and then ultimately we talk about a new part of the market that Mural is staking out for itself, what it calls collaborative intelligence. So that is the topic for this week's show. It's a great t- discussion between Jim and myself, catching up on a lot of the things going on at Mural. The, his thinking, he comes from a, a visual background as a UI, UX He's published a number of books in that space with O'Reilly, but his role as chief evangelist is not just about Mural as a tool, but also about the latest thinking about how do you run hybrid collaboration types activities, brainstormings, ideation sessions, etc. So there's a lot packed into this discussion today. You definitely are going to want to make sure you stay through all the way to the end. But before we hop into this week's episode, got that favor to ask, follow, like, and share. Follow us on social media, like us, give us scores, give us ratings, uh, wherever you get your podcast, and share. If there's other people within your organization or people you know, or you just want to share to help us spread the word onto your social media, greatly appreciate it. Share this week's episode. And with that, let's hop in to this week's episode. This episode is sponsored by Zoom. With Zoom, you can streamline your communication, collaboration, and creativity all in one place. Zoom is the market-leading platform that provides video meetings, voice, webinars, and chat across desktops, phones, tablets, and conference room systems. To learn more about Zoom and sign up for your free account, visit KillerInnovations.com slash Zoom. So, Jim, during COVID, the early stages of COVID, everybody was trying to figure out how to work remote. Mural got some early traction. It got a lot of attention early in the COVID timeframe for being that, you know, digital whiteboard that everybody was scrambling to try to find tools and everybody was trying a bunch of things. But you guys kind of can't, you guys kind of won out there in the early days of COVID of being one that, that people talked about a lot about. A lot of people were using you. Give me a little context. What was Mural's experience during this COVID rush to remote kind of experience? Yeah, suddenly remote, as we called it back then. In fact, we had a webinar series entitled Suddenly Remote because we were trying to help people in that situation where they suddenly found their team remotely. Um, of course, remote work is not new. Uh, I've been an advocate f- of remote work for a very long time. Mural's been around since 2011, actually, um, so long long before the pandemic. But we believe we have a solution that can help people work, particularly creatively, work creatively at a distance, right? Because it is a visual canvas. You can express yourself as you might on a whiteboard or with sticky notes. Uh, and having that ability... Uh, even when your colleagues aren't right next to you, it is is really important. That's what we advocated before the pandemic. And when the pandemic hit, we kind of went from being a vitamin to a painkiller, right? So we believed we had a, a solution that could help people 
but it was also very, very good for our business. There's no secret there, right? Um, that you know things kind of really skyrocketed and, and took off. And we were ready. Um, I think we were ready mentally to uh, take that challenge on because that's what we had been practicing for a very long time. How do you facilitate remote sessions? How do you do a remote design sprint? How do you keep your team together when they're remote, even if you know an agile team or whoever, whatever you're working on? Uh, we had already been practicing on that. It did catch us a little bit off guard in terms of the amount of scale that we had to do within about a two week period, you know, because usage went up, let's, you know, like 10 X. Right. Uh, so that means there was 10 X the amount of support tickets and 10 X the amount of sales calls. Uh, so our, 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 our smaller teams back then were struggling to really keep up with demand, but I think we, we adjusted very, very quickly and we're able to not only keep up the, with the demand from our side, but to keep our customers going and, and new customers that we want as well, too, to get them to be creative, even if they weren't sitting in the same room. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, look, there's been the, this attempt at the digital whiteboards for years, long before COVID. You know, there's been different plays on it, et cetera. But what, it, what was it at that time? Because you guys got a disproportionate share, I would, I would argue. Of, of attention um, early in the COVID, right? But there's a lot of digital whiteboard applications out there. Why Mural? I think there's a, there's a, couple, of, there's a couple of reasons, but one is that we've always been, our, our attitude and our posture towards the market has been more than just, we provide software, right? We, we don't just want to you know, make ones and zeros move on a database and then pixels glow on the screen. And then we charge you once a month for that. that that's software, that's SaaS software. We always kind of stood for more than that. And we had large communities that we engaged, communities of professionals and communities of aspiring practitioners. We also, uh, we're, we also embraced methodology very, very mm -hmm. early on as well too, and methodologies. So design thinking and, um, you know, even things like uh, lean and agile as well, too. So when I think when the pandemic hit, there there were other soft board uh, solutions out there. But I think what Mural then brought to the table was a very deep, implicit understanding of what people were trying to get done and how to actually do that work. So we were a little bit closer to their work and collaboration, particularly through methods and methodologies. Well, I think that was, I think you, it's an interesting different position, right? Because there's a lot of tools out there you can buy, but then teams struggle, like, how am I going to apply it to how I do work? Or how do I apply it to, you know, using it as a, uh, I, a ideation ranking exercise? Or how do I apply it to my frameworks or whatever? It isn't, you know, tools by themselves. Okay, interesting. It's how do you apply it to, a process, a framework, a methodology, that there's this gap. And people struggle with that. People try it out, and if they don't get it in the first session or the first couple of hours, throw that tool out, try it, and move on to the next tool. You're absolutely right. In fact, we've observed for a long time now, even before the pandemic, a phenomenon that we call the blank canvas paralysis. Right. One of the strengths of Mural is it's a blank canvas and we don't prescribe anything. You can do anything that you want. You're in control. Um, that, that's a great benefit. One of the drawbacks of, of Mural is it's a blank canvas and you're completely <laughs> in control. Right. Um, and I can't tell you, I mean, that was, you know, as a customer facing person for the past eight years here at Mural, that's a that's essentially what I was kind of confronting was, OK, great. This is amazing what you guys can offer. But I'm staring at a blank canvas. Where do I begin? How do I start? Right. Right. And we, so, so we've been, we had even before the pandemic, we were working very, very deeply on these questions. And I think things like methodologies that that we inherently understood were are kind of baked into our thinking and, and into the tool to some degree as well, too. Just as an example, we have an extensive template library. Right. So what we're able to do is go out and observe the best practices in lean or agile or design sprints or innovation or design thinking and actually kind of capture capture them and freeze them in a template so that if you're new coming into Mural, you don't have to stare at a blank canvas. You can come with a preformatted, you can start with a preformatted set of methods that we know are proven and they work. 
Yeah. And, and they're also calibrated to do with remote teams or to do with digital tools as well, too. So we didn't just shovel. We didn't just take PDFs that you would print out on the uh, and stick on the wall with sticky notes and shovel them into our tool. We actually recalibrated them so that they were optimized to be done online and remotely. Interesting. I'm a, I'm a big user of, of a Remarkable, Remarkable 2 tablet as an example. And now there's been an entire industry that's birthed up because tablet's great, but it's a blank sheet. It's almost like having a blank index right. card. Yeah. What do you do yeah. with it? And now there's been this whole explosion of people to get help them get started with these tool sets. So you know, and, that, and I, I agree. One of the early attractions for Mural was is it didn't wasn't stuck at the blank page. I mean, if you, you know, you think about uh, Google Jamboard, which was free, and everybody was kind of running running over to Jamboard. It's great, okay? You can do little square boxes. You can color them. You can link them together. But there's nothing that helps you get down the that gets gets you down the path. So. Now that you you know you 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 came into uh, COVID, Mural hasn't stood still, right? I mean, it's you know it's not just about digital whiteboard; it's really about this transition to to visual collaboration, right? Particularly collaborating when, well, COVID it was hundred percent everybody's remote. To now, this transition to the hybrid, where you have maybe some people in a room. Some people remote. What's changed? What what? How has Mural's thinking changed to accommodate yeah. kind of this this new world order? Um, you know, before the pandemic, great question. I was actually just speaking with some new employees. I do an onboarding session every other week, and I was just re kind of retelling this the exact same story to them. Um, we used to place a lot of emphasis on remote. Uh, and if you go back and look at a lot of the webinars and blog posts that I wrote in, you know, 2016, 17, 18, it was all about remote. Now, how do we do remote design sprints? How do we get our teams to be productive and creative remote? Uh, and I think what the pandemic kind of showed us is we need to open that aperture up a little bit because remote is really, you know, it's in-person or remote. That's only part of the story. There's also synchronous and asynchronous. So if you, in your mind, if you think of a two by two matrix, on the one hand is in-person and remote in the two columns. And then on the rows, you have synchronous and asynchronous. You actually get four different modes of collaboration. You don't always have to be working at the same time. You can be working asynchronously. That is, you could be working on the same work product, but at different times. And then, so that gives you four different modes that you can work in, right? A asynchronous, in-person, uh, uh, synchronous, remote, and so forth. But then there's also a fifth mode, which is hybrid. Right, which actually is two modes at the same time. You have some people who are in person and some people are remote and you're collaborating synchronously. So the point of me is kind of sketching that out is I think we have to zoom out and not just say, is it remote? But how do we how do we as a workforce of moving forward, how do we um, ensure that our teams are a lot more fluid across all of those modes? Because really any one employee, you might move from be working asynchronously remote to working synchronously remote. And then you might go into the office and work in person synchronously and then have a hybrid call. That That's just Monday, right? And then yeah. Tuesday, you might be doing that again, right? And everybody in your team is doing that again as well too, right? So we have to we have to have this culture that really embraces fluidity and the portability of work and the continuing of the momentum, so that you're not saying, "Oh, only when we're in person, that's the only time we're creative." You know, you, you know, if that's your attitude, we we can't be creative outside of the office. Well, you're not going to get any work done in the new world, in the post-pandemic world, right? So we've kind of moved our thinking from that's a long answer for we've moved from just really the remote, like how do you get remote teams to be. Uh, collaborating well too. How do we get teams to be collaborating across all of these modes? Yeah, right. Well, and I mean, I so twice a year I teach this course, the Innovation Bootcamp. It's five days, very intense. In COVID, we went purely remote. The last three times I've taught the course, we've done this in a hybrid, right? So some people are in the room and some people are remote. And when you, when, you know, we do surveys coming into the event, we come surveys coming out of the event. And part of this is at the end of five days, they've worked through a, a problem area that we, we were looking from an industry perspective to innovate in. 
They come up with their ideas. They got their pitch, etc. The experience, though, is distinctly different, right? Everybody says, oh, you know, everybody's got to be in the room. And I think that, yeah, that, that doesn't work in today's mode. But how do you bridge the gap of the experience being different? Because yeah. the people that are remote, I think they, bet, they, they see themselves as a benefit of the remote, but it's still not quite the same. How do you bridge that? Yeah, I mean, the, the real answer is we're still learning. Like right. we at Mural and the world, we're still kind of figuring that out. But you touched exactly on the challenge of that hybrid mode of collaboration, which is an imbalance or an inequity in experience. Um, I think one of the things that kind of undergirds that, though, is your ability to think and work digitally, even if you're in person and in the room, right? And this is where Mural, we've been for a very, very long time thinking about how we work on other devices from mobile to large touchscreens, right? So we, we've we worked with the Microsoft Surface Hub, for instance, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with mm -hmm. that device, but it's a large touchscreen device, um, which doesn't, by the way, the technology alone won't solve your hybrid problems, but what it does is it changes the dynamic from writing on a physical sticky note and sticking in on the wall, which locks all the remote folks out of that content to now collaborating, contributing, even if you're in person to a digital format, because now the remote folks can get it. So that's one of the first steps, right. I think, is that you have to be thinking about, even though we're in person, how can we do this digitally so that at a minimum, there's access for the remote folks. But there's lots of other things, everything from audio to video camera angles to the exercises that you do and how sure. you set up the exercises and breakout groups. For instance, one simple question is, do we do breakout groups? So the remote people are doing a breakout group with the remote people and the in-person are doing the in-person? Or do we try to mix across that? So that one breakout group might have a mix of remote people and in-person people, right? That's going to change the technology that you require people to have. That's going to change how you as a facilitator, what, what the logistics are, that the instructions that you give people are going to change as well, too. So, so are, you saying, are you saying uh, there's perspectives to, on that? Is there one size that fits all? I mean, like example of everybody's remote, you know, you put breakouts. Everybody that's remote is in one breakout. Everybody that's in person is in a separate. You do that. Or yeah. do you mix? Does there, have you seen or experienced? I've, I've, I've seen and done both. One of the, one of the questions though is how many people are there? Because sometimes you have five people in the room and 50 people on the call. That That's not a breakout group. Now right. I got to think about breaking them up right. as well too, or vice versa. I've seen that happen as well too. Um, and also then, um, you know how if if you're 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 only contributing to the imbalance if you say remote you guys do breakout groups and in person you guys now now there's another imbalance that's going to happen because those breakout groups are going to be different experiences as well too. Mm. Um, so I don't think there is a one size fits all. It depends on on what you're trying to do. It depends on the size of the group. It depends on what technology people have. Very often the folks who are in person don't have a laptop to be able to do. Uh, a breakout session with the remote folks. Um, oh, by the way, audio is going to be very, very challenging if you try to mix those. So if you say that some of the in people, in, in person people have to collaborate with the remote people, you can't all be in the same room together because the audio from a conference call, the breakout conference call is going to collide with itself, right? So now you have to separate audio. You got to think about audio and separate those teams, the in-person teams. Okay, how do you do that? Can you even do that in the building? There, there's lots of factors that that come into it. But I've done it both. I've seen it done both ways. It's actually, to be honest with you, it's very, very effective to go into breakout groups and keep it mixed, keep it hybrid in the breakout groups. Uh, that's very, it's very, very effective. Yeah, I mean, we've we and we've tried it both ways. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the logistics can be a little bit challenging. We tend to be 12 people in the room, four people remote. So it's, mm -hmm. 16 is we limit it. But it's interesting because we've tried it both ways and we're still trying it, right? Do we yeah. do them together? Do we do them separate? Do we, um, uh, you know, we have coaches for each of the teams, each of the four person teams. So now the coach is the coach virtual with the virtual, you know, and we tried it all, but it's still a challenge. This, yeah. this, um, you know, I guess what you guys call the, the, the fluid work styles, you know, right. other people may refer to as hybrid is we're all still learning. It, it's totally. still early in the process. And I would argue, 
as, as you as you concluded, it, it's not a one size fits all. You've got to be willing to try and experiment because it could be tied to, again, the exercises, the, the which, what the objective of the event is. Whether am I doing just simply a quick ideation sprint, or am I doing a full blown, you know, heads down, you know, five day kind of, you know, we're really going to crank on a on a problem space and and really work it hard. It's yeah. different, right? If you're doing a sprint, you know, a couple of hours, that's one you can do. You can throw those together. If you're going to do something that's extended, maybe it's a different model, right? I don't yeah. think there is a one size. I, I have not, I have not, not found the magic answer, by the I, way. I have not seen it yet either. <laughs> um, and that's why I'm, my default answer, I, I'm not, I'm not passing, passing the buck, but I'll say it depends kind of just like I answered your question there, Phil, is because it really does depend. However, I think, I think we are learning just like we had to learn very, very quickly going into the pandemic. Now, you know, kind of on the other side of the pandemic, if we can agree, we're in the end endemic now that we, we have that, we have that same kind of learning effect. I think it's mm -hmm. going to be longer though. Um, and we're going to kind of slowly kind of figure this out, but there will be uh, there will be some best practices. Here's my prediction: there will be some best practices and kind of configurations, almost like football plays. Like you'll you'll call a play, and then everybody kind of knows how to behave. Part of part of it is how it feels, and what it feels like as a facilitator, and what it feels like as a participant to be in those situations. Right. And we're very uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable right now, but I think it's also just getting used to that uncomfortableness of it, and and working with it instead of against it. Well, I, and, and that's a key point because, you know, when you're running a brainstorm or an ideation session, however you structure your idea, you know, capturing process within your organization, you don't want the hybrid or the tool to be the center of the issue. You want that to kind of just naturally support the real objective, which is you're trying to solve a problem. You're trying to ideate a solution or create a new opportunity for an organization. You don't want everything else kind of getting in the way. And that, I think, is still part of a little bit of the challenge today because you got to spend so much time thinking about how do I put all this together to make it work? And the tools sometimes become a little bit too front and center versus what's the objective of bringing, you know, 10 or 12 year brightest people together. Yeah, I totally agree. And that, that's what I've been seeing as well, too. You, you know, particularly a hybrid team, you bring them together. You say, we have this challenge, let's work on it together. And the first thing that happens is, I can't hear you, the audio doesn't work, can you change your web webcam? And suddenly the technology slips into the foreground, right? And, right. You know, that, that interaction, which is mediated through the technology then, is now a conversation about webcams and audios and whiteboards and not about the topic at hand. I, th I think I think that's a little bit of a growing pain. We're in a transitional phase right now, Phil. I think yep. is, is is what I'm saying. And you know, mural, we're we're dedicated to learning. You know, with with everybody else. Obviously, we see a lot and we push the push the limits. And we're doing a lot of our own experiments. And there are some words of advice that we can give. But I think as a whole, we 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 all have to figure this out and figure it out together. What it's going to take is an experimental mindset. People have to be open. And they have to be willing to say, okay, we're going to try breakout groups a different way and compare it to the last time and see which one works best for us. And we're, we're in a transitional phase where that mindset is being called for right now. Yeah. And that is key. You've got to be willing to try. If it doesn't work out, you go, okay, that one didn't work out too well. Let's try it a different way on the next, uh, on the next activity. So in the case of mural, I mean, you kind of, you know, and you know, Zoom has been a sponsor of this show now eight years. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I get a lot of insight into what's, what Zoom experienced. The big hump into COVID and now coming out of COVID. Um, what has Mural's experience been? I mean, a lot of new, you, you attracted a lot of new customers. Is the usage changed kind of coming out of COVID or is it still, or has it just become now? part of the digital DNA within a, within the use case. I, I think we're starting to see that the very beginnings of a tool like Mural being the part of the digital DNA of the large organizations that, that we service, even this, even the smaller ones as well too. Um, so it is, a, again, we've kind of moved from a nice to have to a must have. And I think the usage patterns kind of reflect that as well too. 
we're we're not we're not shooting straight up like we were at the beginning of the pandemic. I'll tell you that, right? Th- things have started right. to level off. Of course, there's a macroeconomic condition going on right now. That's um, you know in terms of spending and things like that. But usage um, usage continues to to go to, to climb upward, and uh, you know the phone is ringing off the hook with lots of the same questions that you just brought up. How do I do this digital session? And then my answer is it depends. And then, you know, you get into those types of things um, as well, too. So, uh, you know, there's there's definitely a future for us and we definitely play a role in all of this. Because, again, I think what undergirds the new way of thinking about this more fluid way of work is you have to start and end digitally. Right. Because we can't be transcribing sticky notes and taking pictures of whiteboards and all those other kind of workarounds that we tolerated before the pandemic. It's 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 got to be. And, and mural is, a, I think, is a key part of that, obviously, because of the visual nature of it. It also helps you compress some of the tools, but it also means, you know, uh, knowing how to, and to work Zoom and breakout groups and knowing the, the, the complete digital tool set as well, too. Right. Thinking about how am I going to leverage all of those options? The, how am I going to leverage the chat in Zoom? How am I going to leverage a whiteboard like Mural? Just really understanding that digitally defined workplace, um, I think, is going to be key. Because even if you're in person, even if you're in person, you need your first your first thought has to be how do I do that digitally? Right. Exactly. Now, where is Mural going? I mean, you 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 were there before the before the pandemic. You saw this explosive growth. You've been moving the tool forward. Where is Mural going? Where where do you think collaboration, not just whiteboard, but true collaboration, where is that going and what's Mural's role going to be in that? Right. As I kind of mentioned, uh, you know, the answer to your first question earlier, we were always kind of more than just, uh, you know, digital SaaS based product. We were more than about more than just software that we cared about methodology and we cared about the jobs that our customers were trying to get done in terms of facilitation or what their object, what their goals were. Why, why were they coming together in, in a tool like Mural in the first place? And um, in March of this year, we actually announced our aspirations to occupy a larger category that we call collaborative intelligence. Uh, and you can find out on our website, uh, if you go out to the website, mural.co. Um, We have a a document that's kind of a manifesto and what our beliefs are behind that. Um, But it really does go beyond um, just being a software provider. And one of the first pillars in in this uh, journey, this vision that we have towards collaborative intelligence was the acquisition of a company called Luma, L-U-M-A. And Luma um, has a set of human-centered design methods that they can enable and scale across organizations. So they also have the, the training and the, the, the rollout mechanism as well, too. Large organizations like uh, you know, Autodesk and uh, companies like that, Accenture, where, where they've been playing for a very long time, to be able to teach methods across an organization as well, too. Um, so we acquired Luma. So now you have the space where collaboration happens, the digital workspace. Uh, in mural and also the how, what are the methods that you're going to apply um, uh, to the, you know, that you're going to use in that team collaboration. Now, now we have that as part of our, our, our bigger company and we're working towards some other uh, uh, pillars in this collaborative intelligence system that we envision as a solution. We're going to build out more and more as well too. But, you know, the, the short answer is we're really about teams and collaboration because if you think about the challenge that companies have around innovation, Right. They, they want to companies want to innovate. They want to be uh, re- they want to stay relevant. Um, you, you can try to make a process out of innovation or you could chalk it up to luck and all these other things. But when it gets down right to it, it's it's your teams. Right. If your teams are not creative and functioning well, you're not going to come up with in- innovative ideas. If your teams are dysfunctional and everybody dread going to work, you are not going to innovate. Right. So our focus is on teams and team collaboration. And we envision a broader system to make that work. So the, your, your your business on the teams is interesting, right? It's uh, you know how do you how do you facilitate almost culture, right? When mm-hmm. you think about what is what makes teams really yeah. effective and productive is a common culture that encourages that kind of activity, right? You either have defined cultures or what I refer to as accidental cultures, mm-hmm. just a mm-hmm. culture that just you know, naturally emerges. And so 
uh, tools play a play a role in that, right? You know, you know, you have a culture of open and transparent communication, so you use Slack. You have a team, you know, a culture of um, you know certain uh, meeting etiquette, right? So therefore, you have tools like you know Zoom that says. If there's one person not in, you know, like for instance, in our organization, if there's one person not in the room, everybody's on laptop right. because you don't want that long view down the desk, you know, of a long conference room. And all you see is the side of people's heads because the person remote feels that they're not engaged. So we have everybody bring their laptop into the conference room. So it's a, it's a straight on camera shot of everybody. If there's one person remote, everybody is on their laptop. Because you want to make people feel like they're part of the conversation. So if you say you're open to collaboration and communications and everybody gets to participate, don't have a back bench where the remote people are stuffed onto the back bench. But, you know, in the case of tools like, like Mural, when you have, if, if an organization defines a common tool set and says, this is the way we, we come together. And the way we bring ideas together to share them, to discuss them, to organize them in, in some kind of a structure. I think organizations underthink the role that tools have in both supporting and enabling the culture in yeah. things like innovation. Yeah, I agree. I think there's a duality there, right? Um you know, the, the tool itself isn't going to change the culture, but no. introducing a new tool can be can enable new things to happen that would push the culture in a different direction. Yes. For instance, Mural, and I've seen this for a long time now, even before the pandemic, Mural is an open cloud-based um, platform. You can access it right in your browser and multiple people can contribute on a canvas at the same time, kind of like a Google Doc. You're in there collaborating right. together, right? It's live. There, there's no you don't save it as a as a document right um, um, on your on your desktop and everything is up updated automatically right so it's 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 added to the cloud to the canvas and it's up it's updated right in the cloud we we had some early customers that say no we want to we want a version on it we want to be able to lock this down right because their 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 previous model of collaborating on a document together was, uh, you know, uh, creating a, you know, a, a PowerPoint document and naming it something and then un underscore final, underscore final dot V2, underscore final, <laughs> final, right? And they, they were used to kind of locking down collaboration in that way. And then when they came to Mural, they're like, oh, wait a minute, I can't lock it down. And anybody can come in here and change my content at any point in time. I, we have to re rethink what we're thinking about when we talk about, and that, ch that changed the culture. That changed the culture of their attitude towards contribution and contributing to a common cause, right? <laughs> so mural can have that effect. But now, now what you need, the other side of that, though, is, you know, you're talking about culture, is what are the habits and the rituals and the rules of engagement and the etiquettes that go along with that new behavior as well, too, right? So mural required, and so does Slack and other tools. Uh, like Zoom, everybody kind of figured out the you know, the, the, the rules of engagement around muting and unmuting. Right. The, the, the thing about it, Phil, before the pandemic, a lot of people didn't know how to mute and unmute on Zoom. And now you can kind of do it, you know, everybody knows how to mute and unmute. So that was a kind of a behavior that, that got habitualized and people kind of learned that. And, and, you know, we're thinking about all of these new tools and possibilities that are out there. What needs to come along with that are rituals and habits and behaviors and rules of engagement that you then need to develop. But you don't have to leave that to chance. You don't have to leave that to chance. That can be intentional. Right. That you can bring in uh, a point of etiquette or you can bring in a ritual or a method. Uh, you can bring that into your team very, very intentionally. And that's what we believe when we talk about improving team collaboration. It's really about making team collaboration intentional. And not just getting together on a Zoom call or getting together in the office and somebody starts talking and you hope you get to your outcomes is being much more intentional about how that's going to happen. Everything from what are the goals we're trying to do together to what are the rules and engagement and etiquette that we're going to apply here. You can be intentional about all of that. Yeah. And that's really that's really what we're concerned about with collaborative intelligence is the intentionality of collaboration. Well, it's interesting. You know, you're talking about the, the locking down and the final and final V1 <laughs> and final V2, right? It it gets back to organizations will say, oh, we're going to create a living document, but then we lock it down. 
versus collaboration doesn't is not static. It's not cast at a point in time. Collaboration is a continuum. You know, what you did an hour ago is different than what you're doing now. And it's going to be different than you do an hour in the future, right? And how do you keep maintain that fluidity, but be intentional, as you right. said? And how do you create those kinds of environments to make those can be, uh, it's very unique to every organization. Yep. And every organization. And to every, every person too, I would yep. say. It's, I mean, it starts from within. There, there's, there's a new mindset and a new, you know, what's my, what's my initial instinct? Uh, you know, is it, is it to, uh, is it to finalize and you know, put a version name on a file of, of a document or is it to keep it uh, as an open and living uh, artifact? And I, just one quick example of that. I have a, a customer of ours, um, he's fairly high level, like a design strategist, let's say. And he'll work, typically what we used to do is work backstage. You'd work out all the messy details of, you know, brainstorming and a design strategy. And then whatever you come up with goes into a PowerPoint presentation so you can present it to your stakeholders for a decision. And then and then you go backstage and you get messy and then you bring it to the front stage again. He decided to just do that all in one mural canvas. So his backstage, he would clean things up in a kind of a front stage but his backstage was right to the left. If you just scrolled over, you would see his messy <laughs> backstage. And then he got feedback from his stakeholders on the, you know, the, the little bit that was presentable. You just share a screen and show the mural there. And then he'd take that feedback and go backstage again and then just do that. So basically his undulation between front stage and backstage, he just did it all in one live cloud-based thing, right? And didn't move in and out of PowerPoint and other things, which actually reduced his tool set, right? Because now, now he can kind of go out the date and all that fluidity. Uh, all that fluidity that we talked about, he can come right out of the gate and and just be in one tool now. Well, and I think that's, you know, it's an interesting model of how, though, how the human brain works, right? You know, you don't park your brain and back up a version of it and stick it someplace and then load a new one, right? You've got everything rattling around in your head and you're taking all these inputs and you're applying them as, as, as you, as you see fit. So, very, very, very interesting. So, hey, as we wrap up, Jim, today's episode, um, if people want to find out more about Mural, where's the best place for them to go uh, get some information? Yeah, uh, Mural.co, um, not .com, it's Mural.co. Um, we do have free trials, but there's a lot of resources there in terms of webinars and events and things that we have. Um, and I would check out our blog as well, too, because a lot of the more practical things can kind of uh, ooze out of our blog and some tools and things that you can download. Uh, we also have a, a template section, both in the product and on the web uh, uh, site as well, too. And I would, I would, I would urge people to, if you're going to explore one thing on the website, go check out the template section because you can start to then see the breadth of use cases that um, you can use with Mural because it, it it just goes on and on and on. You know, we've seen everything from. You know, HR teams to exec teams, uh, chief of staff using Mural to plan out an org chart, uh, obviously agile and lean teams, uh, creative teams of any kind. Uh, there's just lots and lots of different uses. And a lot of that gets reflected in the template section that we have. Right. So that's perfect. And we'll have links for that over uh, in the show notes over at killerinnovations.com. So with that, hey, Jim, thanks a lot for taking the time out of your schedule. and. Uh, Thanks for sharing with us the update on uh, where Mural came from. It was the a pleasure craziness talking to, to you. I, I, re I appreciate your show, and I'm thrilled to be on here. Looking forward to the episode. Great. Thanks, Jim. Catch you later. So what is your thoughts around tools? What tools are you using? What tools have you found really interesting and effective in your creative innovation efforts. Love to hear that. Post them in the comments or just drop me a note over at phil at killerinnovations.com. Now, in the case of Mural, if you hop on over to mural.co, they're offering free trials. You can test it out, see what you think about it. Uh, Mural has become a quite popular tool, particularly with larger organizations, albeit those tools were perfectly fine in the medium and small uh, business space also. And don't think of them. Don't have them stuck in your mind that it's just yet another digital whiteboard. Hopefully listening to Jim share what their talks, what their vision, uh, where they're heading. And I'm kind of, it can be kind of interesting to see 
how they build out this concept of collaborative intelligence. That would be a follow-up story at some point in the future. But again, hopefully you got a lot out of this today, not just about mural, but also about how to think about collaboration and hybrid events and hybrid work environments and team, innovation culture, all the things we covered. So hopefully you found that uh, interesting and uh, effective. So with that, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule. Do greatly appreciate it. Time is your most valuable asset, and you have chosen to spend that time with me, and I do greatly appreciate that. Um, as always, uh, stay tuned. We will have another great episode next week as we ramp up and get ready for season 19. Yes, I cannot believe it. Um, we will be starting season 19 in March here, not too far away. So, uh, so we'll be here next week with another great episode. In the meantime, take those ideas, get them out of the year notebook, start working on them, deliver and execute and change the world. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Podcasting nonstop since 2005. This has been the Killer Innovation Show on the Innovators Network. This show is distributed by the Innovators Network. For more information and other great shows and content, visit theinnovators.network.